morning everybody. In this video I'm going to be talking about wood frame gable roofs, which according to Google are the most common types of roofs. As always, before we get into the video, please make sure you like the video and subscribe to the channel. Now you know gable roofs are the most common types of roofs. It also appears that wood stick frame roofs are my one of my primary areas of expertise. So let me tell you about what I know from a structural engineer standpoint about wood frame roofs. In this video, I'm going to be explaining them the different terminology to different members and I'll also be highlighting how forces are transferred through these stick frame roofs. So let me tell you about the year 2018 here in Sudbury, Ontario. That was the year that we've had the highest amount of snow load, which correlated to a lot of failed roofs. Now, most roofs here in Sudbury prior to 1990 were built with stick frame. So they weren't pre-engineered trusses, which are another way to form these gable roofs. They were actually just stick frame. So dimensional lumber pieced together to make this roof. So I can tell you in the year 2018 and 2019, I must have climbed in over 200 roofs. I figured out what the failure modes was. I've seen essentially what, where they typically fail and how they fail. And I could really back up some of the theory and some of the concepts I'm going to be talking about in this video. Let me get onto Revit, which is one of the softwares that I use for drafting and detailing. Nice and easy to use. It'll be perfect what I'm trying to do. So let me get right into it and let's drop a frame for you so I can explain the parts and the concepts of this stick framed roof. guys like that montage because that almost killed me. All right, without further ado, let's pull this up. All right, guys, so I just kind of threw one of these quick uh, framing uh, drawings together. So just to show the different members. So don't take this too seriously. This is not something I would present to a client or anything. Like that. This is just a quick thing for this video just to show you guys uh, some of the, the, uh, the important members and what to look for in a stick frame roofs. I didn't explain stick frame yet. What stick frame means is that the, the, everything's made of dimensional numbers. So you'll either hear it called stick frame or wood frame. Uh, typical terminology around here in Canada is stick frame. So the roof starts with the ridge board. So that's this member here. The ridge board, believe it or not, is not a load bearing member. That's something that a lot of people get confused on. They think that the ridge board is load bearing. However, that's a common misconception. The, rib, the ridge board is only there as a framing member, and it's only this way you can frame the rafters in two. As you can see, the rafters are the members that make up your gable. They're the ones that run up and down like this. As you can see, this is a 412 pitch roof. Uh, so they're the ones that frame into your ridge board. Typically, what you'll see in residential framing, uh, most codes actually call for your ridge board to be one size larger than your rafters. So let's say you have a two by six dimensional lumber rafter, you'll uh, need a two by eight dimensional lumber ridge board. So uh, from a structural standpoint, your rafters are typically in bending. So while the load is being applied to your rafters like this, uh, it actually causes the, uh, the member to want to bend. So that's the typical uh, modes that you'll have to check for this. Now moving down, we have our collar tie. So our collar tie is a member that's uh, framed within the rafter. So connecting the two rafters together. Uh, a common misconception is that people think that collar ties are usually always in tension. Now based on where they're located, they might be uh, in a mixture of tension uh, or they might be compression. So the lower they are, um, like typically if you get within the lower third, you'll probably likely be in tension. Uh, however, if you're within, the, um, if you're higher up, you're in compression. And what that does is it really splits up the span for your rafters. So having collar ties allows you to shorten the span of your rafter that's in bending. So you can actually get it with a smaller size. As you know, it's WL squared over two, your L is squared. So the length or your span of your beam is uh, squared. Uh, so that means that uh, you can actually get away with a much larger, uh, a much larger span on a smaller, uh, smaller member. Uh, typical sizes that we see here around here in Canada, where our snowballs are on two kPa, or forty pounds per square foot, roughly for um, uh, residential roofs. So we typically see two by sixes or two by four rafters. Again, depending on this on the span, 
There are building code tables for these, or you can calculate them the engineering way. Uh, most of the time, most engineers around here just use the tables in the building code if you're dealing with a Part 9 uh, structure. Part 9 is the residential side of the uh, Ontario building code, which we have here in Canada. So now we move down. So you'll see I, this, I drew in an interior load bearing wall. So that's just typically because when uh, we're dealing with a stick frame uh, roof, let's say we have a 24 foot span, it's hard to get a ceiling joist, which is this member here, which holds the ceiling and the attic insulation in a 24 foot length. So there's this thing that we call the ceiling joist splice, which is where the two members, so let's say if you, this is 24 feet across, you'll have two 12 foot members, and they're usually spliced over this area. Now, when I talk a little bit more about the forces, you'll understand why this is such a critical piece. And actually, spoiler alert, this is the uh, one of the most critical areas of failure in uh, residential roofs. Uh, so we have the exterior load bearing walls. We typically see a double top plate, which is this here. You'll notice that two top plates uh, are framing the outside wall. Most outside walls now are two by sixes. Again, I could talk about this more in a residential framing video. The reason for that is due to insulation requirements uh, that we've uh, upgraded in the latest building code. Uh, we have here, which we would call the overhang, uh, which is usually uh, to have an eave so that when the water drips down, it doesn't directly fall into your outside walls uh, and that's causing some building off a little bit. All right, so before I get too far into this, I just wanna have a typical disclaimer. None of this is my professional opinion. This is just kind of showing some concepts. Uh, and if you need somebody to analyze any trusses or any structural member, please contact a professional engineer licensed in your area. To begin, the first thing we gotta look at is the snow load. That's the primary load that's being applied and it's being applied to the rafters. So that load is a gravity load, which may be a snow or a live load, like I previously mentioned, and it's a gravity load. So it's pointed down and it's treated as a uniformly distributed load. The other uniformly distributed load is on the ceiling joist. It comes from all the dead load of the materials that are being applied to it. So that includes your insulation, your uh, finishes, whether that's you know a drywall or a drop ceiling, and your mechanical and some of your electrical. So it's not very big. Uh, there's a, there are minimum uh, design criteria for the dead load in your ceiling joist, and each code have different requirements. Here in Ontario, uh, there is a requirement, so I'm assuming most uh, other uh, jurisdictions have those same requirements. When looking at solving these, essentially what you could do is you could use the method of joints, which, uh, as you can see, you'll have you'll separate your load. So you'll have a, uh, a large load at the ridge board. These are very generic sketches. There's obviously uh, more uh, intricate uh, analysis that we could perform uh, using some uh, finite element software, such as S-Frame or Stack Pro, etc. So there's a vertical load uh, that's going to be transferred from that UDL. It's going to go right up to your ridge board. And then there's going to be a, a load in the X direction or uh, horizontally and then one gravity load down again at your outside walls. So that's where the tension in the ceiling joists come in is to resist that outward force. What I see most of the time is when that uh, ceiling joist splice and the ceiling joist, the rafter connection is not done adequately, you'll see failure. So you'll see a uh, drywall cracking. If the drywall cracking is perpendicular to your ceiling joist, that typically indicates that there might be some, uh, some movement and that your ceiling joist connections might not be performing. Your ceiling joist connections, so that's your rafter ceiling joist or your ceiling joist splice, are typically just dictated based on the forces applied. So once you do your analysis uh, using your first principles, you'll determine what that force is and then you'll design for it. Uh, the connection is typically done using nails. Building codes do have requirements for those. So based on the pitch of your roof and your snow load, there'll be different requirements for both the rafter ceiling joist and your ceiling joist splice connection. To determine whether your collar ties are in tension or compression, you'll have to do some analysis. Uh, most of the time they are in compression, uh, but sometimes they can be in tension if they're in the lower portion of the rafter. So there is a gravity load for the uh, ceiling joist applied on the interior load bearing wall. Again, that load is typically very small, uh, but that's something else you need to consider when you're designing this. Again, this is just kind of a rough, uh, high overview. I don't want to make this video too long. Uh, if this video gets enough traction, potentially I'll do another one in the future, kind of going into more detail. Thanks a lot for watching the video. As always, please subscribe to the channel. It really helps me grow. I'm really hoping to get the channel monetized in 2021, which I'm actually quite a far away from doing. Um, so yeah, please subscribe. I upload on Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. If you have anything you want to see me talk about, please leave it down in the comments below. And as always, see you next time.